Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it looks like we've got most of the attendee list in here so far, so uh, we can go ahead and get started. I appreciate your patience while uh, we let some of the, uh, the attendees jump on. And uh, apologies if you had to hear me repeat that about four or five times. So uh, I appreciate everybody joining us today. Um, I know most of you on this call, but for those that don't, my name is Andrew Morton. I am a previous fleet operator, a, uh, an NICABI user, uh, and I'm currently the commercial director for North America at ICABI. So today's uh, webinar is really going to be focused around um, recovery strategies and uh, reshaping your taxi fleets as we come out of this sort of depressed period within the market. So um, on the agenda today, we first want to talk a little bit about, you know, why we're hosting this, why we, we what signs of recovery we're starting to see, what the progress is, um, really give kind of a, a foundation to, uh, to hosting this. And then we want to walk you through these seven different strategies that we really, we feel have been deployed pretty effectively uh, over the last couple of months, but we'll also position fleets um, you know, to be successful coming out of this as business starts to ramp back up. So uh, the initial part will be focused really around diversification and elaborated with on, uh, on with new markets uh, where we're, we're seeing our fleets currently find success. Uh, we do want to cover safety because there's a bunch of uh, initiatives that have been happening um, throughout the taxi industry, both stuff that we've kind of created and perpetuated, but also some different programs. Um, we're going to look at digital payments and data applications. Um, and then finally, we'll round off with some, uh, some, some tips on operational efficiency with some automation pieces, some technology pieces, uh, and then we want to round it out with partnerships. Um, so we'll get into each of these specifically, but let's start with um, where we are today. So, you know, historically at ICABI, we have tracked booking progress um, throughout the year, how, what fleet performance looks like um, on a country level and then also on a global level. And as you can see by this chart, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a comparative data from January of 2020 to, uh, to current as of uh, end of July or as of yesterday. So, Obviously, we can see on this chart in North America, we pretty much fell off a cliff, right? I mean, we had, we, we had customers saying 70 to 80% loss uh, within their business platforms, which is reflected here. Um, again, we were running at, uh, I think at the lowest point, 33% of the bookings um, that we were doing, you know, that customers were doing in January and February at the beginning of the year. So, um, but once we hit that floor, we've subsequently seen somewhat of a rebound. Um, now I know that, you know, everybody's in a different position. Some fleets have recovered more than others. So definitely keep in mind that this is an average across all customers in North America. Uh, but we've seen this steadily climb back up to where it sits today, which is about 64% uh, of the booking volume that was done at the same time uh, over in the previous year. So um, it's not 100% and by no means are we out of this. But as you guys can see from the data that we are steadily seeing a, an increase or an incline um, over the past couple of weeks, which again to us is indicating, hey, we're starting to see a resurgence of bookings. We're starting to see drivers come back. Um, and how are we preparing for this reshaped market? Uh, and are we ready to take on those bookings, right? You know, a lot of people had to reshape their business um, when COVID hit and we had the fall off, you know, like I said, the 70, 80% fall off. So are we ready to take on um, this, this recovery and, and approach? Uh, structured appropriately for the new markets. Um, we're seeing similar trends globally. This is across all ICAB customers. Um, as you can see, the, the fall off was a little bit more dramatic if we consider um, all countries in which we operate. Um, but we're seeing similar trends where on a global level, we're seeing continued increase, slight incline, on average about five to 7% growth week over week. Um, so it's, it's definitely trending in a positive direction. And so really, what does that mean for the taxi industry? Well, as we said and looked at the data, and it's again been consistent over the past couple of months, recovery is really on. Um, and I'll preface this by a, an interesting conversation I had a couple of weeks ago. We're talking to one of our, our resellers um, up in the Canadian market, uh, and he was sharing some feedback that he had, he had from uh, some of his prospect engagements over the last few weeks. And he was talking about a, a fleet in a particular market. I won't, I won't share details, but he said he was speaking with these prospects and, you know, he, he was asking what caused them to look at change or what caused them to look at, you know, moving systems, changing their operation. And the fleets basically said to him that, you know, the market is completely different now. The, the, the business sources, 
uh, the way that they performed previously was just not going to cut it in this new market um, and that they had to adapt. They had to become a different company if they were going to continue to survive and not only survive, but to thrive in this change market. And so they literally said to him, you know, we can't do things the way that we've always done them. And so it's interesting because we're hearing that sim a similar sentiment echoed across the customer base in North America, also with our prospects that we're talking to. And there's definitely been a, um, a, a reinterest of, uh, a, from a prospect side on the sales side. But um, really what we want to focus fleets around is being prepared to adapt and embrace that change, right? We shouldn't be resistant to it because it's affected everybody and it's the new standard for the market. So we want to put you guys into a position where you're going to be entrepreneurial, resourceful. We want to support that growth. Um, and we want you to be ready for anything in the future that may come up or, or, or may change. I mean, this, this obviously hit, um, hit the taxi industry in a really substantial way um, and was incredibly impactful to our business. So we want to put ourselves in positions um, as an industry as a whole where things like this happen again, whether it's financially driven, you know, it's a, a pandemic outbreak, whatever it may be, we are diversified and can actually um, sustain in these sort of shifted markets. So um, the next piece we want to look at here, or the first piece that we want to look at here, excuse me, um, it really starts with business diversification, right? And there's a couple of ways that we've seen that we can look at this. So uh, initially, we want to focus on an expansion through, and, and again, these can be in a particular order, but uh, expansion or diversification comes into deliveries. And that's really focused around a couple of different channels within the delivery application. So um, the core of this, where we'll start, is with B2B. And that's really assisting, um, you know, local businesses and signing up with them to actually get their goods or, and products to market, right? Um, so a couple of good examples of this, we had formed some partnerships with um, some grocery grocery stores, but the actual distribution channels, right? Because they had all these these goods or these products in um, in their in their consolidated warehouses that they couldn't get out to the consumers, right? Or even at the end user in the store, right? The customer wants to get their groceries, wants to get their food, um, and they couldn't get them out to the customers because there were travel restrictions in place. Um, so taxis really have facilitated um, bringing those products to the market for the customers. Um, another really interesting one that we've seen kind of emerge, and this, this will play a little bit into a uh, new market evolution, but some customers were doing this already, but it's, it's, it's really... Um, uh, kind of increased demand for pharmaceutical delivery. So again, you know, a lot of customers can't get out to the store or they're afraid to go out to the pharmacy because they're within that specific demographic that's impacted by COVID. And so we've seen this emergence um, that's actually driven by hospital systems who are saying, look, I can expand my services without the cost of the footprint. So I'm doing, you know, my doctor visits online, I'm writing scripts online, but the real challenge is how do we get those out to the passenger? So again, another way to plug in from a B2B standpoint. Um, and we'll talk about this again in more depth. Um, on the B2C side, that's really your traditional collect and deliver. We built some feature enhancements around that, which we'll go into. And then lastly, we have sort of a B to B to C kind of concept, which think of it in this way. It's really how do we build out kind of a unique marketplace or create our own marketplace within the areas which we operate, where we have a full sort of life cycle or, or system to, um, it's really end to end, I guess, for the user in terms of getting the products and getting them delivered. So again, on the B2B side, um, I think the pharmaceutical piece, uh, if this is a great example, there's a ton of contract companies out there um, that are that are looking for uh, taxis to do delivery of pharmaceuticals. A lot of the hospital systems have continued to uh, are starting to engage with local taxi fleets to help perpetuate this. Um, Amazon has seen a, an incredible, you know, not a resurgence, but a, just an incredible growth through this period. Everybody is ordering online, and they don't have the scaled capacity to actually be able to always deliver this. And so they need support, and they need people to plug into the delivery solutions. And there's ample opportunity for that within. Um, Amazon's contracting services. So they have portions of that that they're offshoring or outflowing to, um, to different customers. And again, even the basic stuff, right? Local partnerships have really um, played a big part in this where we see fleets being successful. Again, the lo local grocers, um, even again, you know, um, local source stuff where you're doing like, hey, we've got even farmers market, right? Like we're, we're seeing customers or taxi fleets get plugged in with a variety of different businesses and are supporting delivering that product. 
On the B2C side, um, this is really an extension of that B2B piece of it, but it really is going direct interface to the customer, right? And so on our end, we, we wanted to deliver this through the app, and many of you have used this product um, on the, uh, at, as customers, for those of you that are, that are already using the service on the call. And, and that was a core driver for us to add delivery services to the new mobile app platform. So we need something that's intuitive for the customer. It starts around building a framework where, you know, it's, it, 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 there's already services that are online and they just need avenues to deliver it. So again, grocery stores are, are very frequently come into this pharmaceuticals. We've created a system that's really dynamic. So it allows users to plug into all those variables that can do grocery delivery. They can do, do get their pharmaceuticals picked up, et cetera. So we've built that flexibility in for the customers. But we want to start thinking about, hey, what are these pieces where we've had traditional pickup, whether it's, I mean, even, um, so I ordered some camping equipment from REI uh, the other day, and they have curbside pickup available, but they don't have a delivery piece plugged into that. So if we can go out and locally market to our customer base and say, hey, look, we're willing to plug in and do these services for you, you could do everything from, like I said, the curbside pickup at a, at a camping equipment company to, hey, I've got you, I need you to go and pick up my grocery packages at the local produce store. So the last one that we'll talk about is this B2B to B to C uh, delivery type of system. And again, think of this in the framework of, we're gonna create a whole ecosystem for the passenger for delivery. And so to give you a good example of this, it, we have a partner in our marketplace called Caboodle It, which, allows taxi fleets to go in and sort of structure their own delivery network, right? So Caboodle it will help the, the fleet build the end-to-end -end partnerships. They'll go out, um, they'll help you, or they'll facilitate you um, getting into agreements with local restaurants, again, local pharmacies, um, any place that has these products that they want to be delivered. And then they'll create the platform whereby the customers can go in and order those goods and services. And the taxi fleet is already plugged into this as an extension as the delivery service within this platform. So essentially what you're doing is combining all these B2B and B2C pieces together into one single consolidated ecosystem. And we've seen that work very, very effectively. This has been um, a big product that's used in the UK. Um, and it's starting to get some traction in North America as well because it allows you to take this, this structured ecosystem and put them into one place, right? A lot of times customers, um, they, they know where they can order services, but they don't know, hey, they don't make that connection of like, I can order exactly like I just described. I can order my camping equipment. It's curbside pickup, but I could actually use my taxi fleet to schedule it. So again, thinking about applications where we're saying, look, we're going to form local partnerships with restaurants, with grocery stores, with pharmacies. We'll plug them into this ecosystem. We've created a space where the customer now can go into an online portal and order goods and services through this. And I've already got the, the transportation infrastructure here um, because I'm plugged into this as a taxi fleet and I'm going to automatically do the delivery. So three different channels to kind of build a framework around. Um, but that leads us more into new and expanding markets and where we're seeing um, our customer base kind of develop uh, additional sources of transportation. So an interesting statistic, um, our customer base has seen uh, roughly a 50 to 60 percent transition of their business from, you know, the traditional cash, uh, traditional flag bookings to corporate account type bookings. Uh, and that represents a broad diversity. So when I say corporate accounts, we kind of generalize there. but um, it's, it's a large variety of trips. And, you know, again, in conversations with customers, I, I had, I had one specific on a, a customer success call where the guy literally said to me, he's like, I'm never doing a cash trip again. Right. And he said that somewhat facetiously, but the reality is, is, is that those bookings um, are becoming less reliable. They're becoming less consistent. Um, and we want to get a broader diversity of trips coming into the system, right? Because if we can get this sort of diverse, these diverse channels of revenue streams, then we're less susceptible to things like pandemics or to, you know, economic downturns, because while one channel is poorly performing, the other one is probably having success, right? Um, and so it's just some, some places that we're actually starting to see this, these expansions of this market. Um, some of you, this will be pretty obvious, is, is patient transportation and medical trips. One thing that's been really interesting, though, during COVID is that you know, people still have to get to the doctor, people still have to get to dialysis, people still have to get their medications. And so, you know, that while there's been a definitely a downturn in the overall booking volume, those bookings from, you know, partner brokers have become more consistent. 
um, or, or have stayed consistent, at least in some levels throughout, throughout COVID and are again ramping back up. And what's interesting to see is that um, these, these sort of, whether it's a broker or a hospital system is saying, look, I can expand the scope of my services, as I mentioned before, without actually expanding my footprint. You know, I don't have to go create a medical center. I don't have to put my doctors in these various locations. Um, I can do most of this remotely, but I need the infrastructure to move them back and forth. And taxi tends to be a really cost effective and efficient way to deploy that. Um, and there's a variety of ways that you can plug in on this side, right? There's, there's a multitude of uh, channels for RFPs. There's various brokers throughout uh, throughout North America that will work on and facilitate these trips. Um, so it's something that you know many com customers have already expanded to, but it's something that's very easy to get engaged with as you're going. Um, I will say, just I'll touch on this um, because it has been an opportunity, although a little bit of a um, it's been a touchy subject. So we are seeing a lot of um, a lot of fleets. Uh, engage with their local hospitals and those hospitals are asking drivers to transport COVID positive patients. Now there's been some really interesting and in, in, uh, sort of, I guess, um, uh, it, just different protocols for how those drivers are actually servicing those trips. Um, you know, there's a lot of safety protocols, the hospitals are engaging um, in different ways to make sure that, you know, the driver is safe, that the cars are kept, uh, you know, sanitary. Um, but it's a huge revenue opportunity. The booking, um, the booking rates on those types of trips are, are pretty high. Um, and so it's, it's definitely, again, not something to say, hey, we can build an entire business model around it, but just I'll touch on that as, as sort of a, a piece that's come out because the hospitals can't move those patients. Um, so again, an add-on -on piece. We're also seeing um, an expansion in government programs. Um, so again, government business or uh, government um, employers really trying to manage the movement of their of their employees, um, and it's becoming an expanded service. We've we've kind of facilitated some of this through the expansions within our mobile app. So if any of you are using the mobile app today or not familiar with it, we have added a um, a segment where customers can pay with uh, paper vouchers or what they would traditionally use paper vouchers for, they can actually migrate that to a digital booking um, and do all of that through the app or through a web booker. And really what that's done is it's perpetuated government usage because it's eliminated a cost infrastructure, not having to fill out these paper vouchers, et cetera, but also um, it's, it's a contactless payment. So as we come out into this new, you know, again, COVID cases are reducing, but we still have to be concerned about safety and protocols. Um, that ability to loop in contactless payment to not be filling out vouchers and handing off products is, is it really enhanced those those programs. And again, it's this can be a variety of government programs, whether it's something like um, a DDS, DDS Medicaid type of services, uh, VA type of trips, or even something as simple as like, look, you know, we've seen in Canada programs where we have, you know, federal employees that are being moved around. And so there's a, definitely a transition there. The next two are, are somewhat influenced by the same, uh, same market conditions. So we have last mile service from municipalities and also school transportation. And so what's been happening is there was really, if you're talking about school transportation specifically, there was already a shortage of, um, of buses and drivers. I, I live out here on the West Coast in Las Vegas, and we had a huge issue um, where there just was, there was not enough busing services for all the students. Um, and so again, because it's dynamic, it's flexible, it tends to be cost effective. Taxis have been able to plug into these types of services, whether it's, you know, doing the school transportation or I remember I was once in a, uh, a meeting with a uh, transportation administrator for the busing system for a major city back on the East Coast. And he told me, he's like, I'm paying $400,000 a year to pick up eight people on a route daily. He's like, I'm not definitely not earning my way out of that. So um, plugging into these gaps within school transport or these gaps within um, municipal transportation, uh, doing that last mile type of service so the busing system can get more efficient on their core routes uh, is something that can be um, tremendously effective and tremendously profitable for a lot of taxi companies. Where that's been enhanced over the last couple of months is a lot of these services um, can't provide consolidated busing services, right? You can't put a bunch of students on a school system. And I know that, you know, there's a lot of schools that are going to go digital, but for those that are going back to school or they have to do um, uh, parent care services, uh, as well as busing services, they can't put all these people into, into a bus because it's just not, it's not safe from a health protocol standpoint. And so what you're seeing is an increase in requests for services, RFPs, contract requests to uh, do individual ridership 
for each of uh, each of these passengers, and that's something that you know the the, the transportation um, groups are covering the cost of. So it's a great way again to get plugged into these aggregated services that have long term implications in terms of a need for transportation. Um, the last piece I'll talk on is is kind of an interesting one. So um, it really revolves around data collection, you know, and there's definitely been concerns about um, you know driver uh, driverless cars and automation and how does that impact the transportation industry. But one really interesting thing that's come out of it is there's companies out there that are willing to provide services or even pay. Um, for taxi data essentially. So um, we've had engagements in various fleets from companies like Google, um, and it even extends to products, I guess I should say like uh, 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 Bridgestone uh, or Firestone are great examples of companies where they've said, look, we wanna collect taxi data, on, or we wanna collect data on usage um, on our tires or our, our vehicle parts. So we're willing to come and we will upfit all of your, your vehicles with new tires, right? Which is a huge expense for many taxi fleets. And say, so we'll give that to you for free if you can just you know give us the information of the data back because taxi drivers are obviously putting a ton of mileage a ton of usage on their vehicles and so companies that are trying to um, assess the quality of you know vehicle products or likewise are trying to collect as much data as possible on actual driver behavior vehicle behavior they're willing to come out and either again supply products or even pay uh, companies to get that data from them. So it's again, it's alternative revenue sources and it may not be something that's, you know, in a traditional format of what you would do, um, but those those opportunities are out there and they exist. So what's the whole point of this? We want you to think again about how else you guys can diversify as taxi fleets, right? That's the frame set uh, or, or mindset that we need to be framing here um, because we can't rely on our traditional booking services, right? That may be increasing, we may see market recovery, but again, we've seen that, the, that our traditional types of services are uh, at risk from these market changes. And so again, the best way to position um, ourselves as a company and ourselves in industry and taxi fleets in general is to say, look, we need diversified uh, streams of bookings or revenue coming into the business. So again, if one falls off, we have other opportunities, we can plug in and be successful elsewhere. And we're not dependent on this one group of bookings. So that brings us next to the safety strategy. Excuse me. Um, and so we first want to start about some resources that we've we've published. Um, you know, there's there's obviously been a lot of um, uh, questions and comments and and uh, processes put in place around safety and you know how we're uh, promoting and perpetuating recovery as we come out of COVID. Um, we did publish a resource guide um, or, or publish a blog within our resource guide uh, for iCabby that kind of details and walks through some best practices. You know, one of the interesting perspectives that we've been able to have and we're in a lot of ways fortunate to have this is we've been talking to a lot of our fleet partners that have had to transport and had to move COVID positive patients, right? So how are they dealing with that? How are they keeping drivers safe? How are they keeping other drivers or other passion passengers safe? How are they keeping the vehicles clean, et cetera, right? And so we've got some real life best practices um, that we can actually share with other fleets because it's, we want that commonality. We want the, uh, taxi to be seen as the safe transport alternative, which I'll, I'll come to in a second. But I pulled a few highlights from this, uh, from the blog post that we, we shared. And again, if you go to our website, all of this information can be found in the iCabby um, COVID-19 resource hub. Um, but there's a couple things that I thought were interesting that kind of uh, may get overlooked in the blog post that I wanted to talk about. So um, obviously there's, there's now a ton of product solutions out here um, in terms of, you know, everything from plexiglass shields to contactless payment solutions, which we'll get to. Um, there's a variety of, of those products being pushed out now that are really quality and are really having some positive um, implications or impacts on the, the safety um, for drivers. And so we can connect you to any of those resources as you need them. So definitely feel free to rely on this. But one of the things that I think really stands out is the action to make a plan, right? We all know that we have to keep the drivers safe. We have to make sure that if we're, if we're testing or moving uh, COVID positive patients or even customers in general, that we need to put in safety protocols. But where we found that this kind of fell off is if there wasn't a clearly defined um, operating procedure that was shared down to the drivers, right? They're the, the level one support, the first line uh, contact for your customers. And so what was really helpful where customers were, or uh, fleets were really successful um, is where they, they clearly shared 
what drivers should and shouldn't be doing and what the process was for moving patients, the safety protocol, et cetera. When they outlined that process very clearly, and then they shared that information with the drivers and the training so the drivers were aware, it, it, it increased the effectiveness of these safety programs and I think led to long-term booking increases because they were able to do it. It creates a much better customer experience if you can get in and the customer expectations are there uh, and they know what to expect. And it leads to a second bullet point that we have on here, which is to notify the customers of the restrictions. So, you know, one of the things that we want to try and leverage is, um, you know, are, are there SMS uh, notifications that we can put within the web hooks in the platform? Can we push anything down through the mobile app? How can we share these, these practices or these processes? So customers are aware of what the expectations are on their end, you know, don't, touch the driver, don't touch the payment system, make sure that you're not, you know, if you have COVID symptoms, you're not riding in the vehicles, et cetera, so that they're not upset or disrupted as they're going through the process and they have expectations of what the taxi ride experience is going to be like. It's important to share that plan down with them as well. And we've seen customers do that effectively through some of the channels I've named or even going into, um, you know, marketing it through social media, talking about it there, having open conversations. It's, it's definitely helpful. Um, I'll touch back on, uh, I'll come back to promoting the contactless payment because it is part of the safety process, but we have this defined elsewhere in here, but it is something that we want to focus on as a, as an efficiency strategy. So we've, we've really focused on sharing these safety strategies um, and, and I'll talk in a second about, you know, what those practices are and how we're trying to get that out across the industry. Um, but we also want you guys, we want to encourage you to talk about that, right? Because one of the things that's really interesting is that, you know, people have said, as with all things, right? whether it's inclement weather or there's uh, you know, there's, there's some natural disaster going on. People are like, Oh yeah, well I can still get in and get a taxi. Right. And that's been kind of a, a positive for the industry from a PR perspective is that we are consistently there um, to deliver support, to support riders, to make sure they get to where they need to go and that they don't get cut off from these essential accesses that they need. Um, but what we found is that fleets that promoted that are, are, are able to actually start to drive their bookings because they have this sort of, um, they create this brand presence of, of safety, right? So I want to encourage you to talk about safety practices on your social media channels. We can help you create um, you know, custom SMS messages that share some of the things that you're doing out to your passengers. So again, when they get into the vehicle, they know exactly what the expectation is, um, what's going to happen. We can create, um, again, custom messaging or alerts within the IVR, um, separate channels to talk to customers that may have concerns about the ridership. Um, and also letting, you know, your corporate customers know that you're doing what you're doing, that you're still in business, that you're still out there and the safety protocols that they're, they're taking. You know, one of the things that's been interesting about this is that, you know, while some businesses have been detrimentally impacted, like the, the taxi industry, some businesses continue to run as normal. And so it's important to continue to engage with the, um, your, your corporate accounts to let them know, Hey, we're still open. We're still active. We're still here to help move your people. Um, and if you need us, you can count on us and rely on us. And again, just that message messaging we've seen across the board um, sort of resuscitate the bookings and, and make sure that, you know, people don't think like, okay, well, the, the taxi is not going to be safe. And so we don't want to use it and we'll just disconsider them. Right. Um, so, so those are important pieces. And off the back of that, we've kind of segue in and, and form this partnership across a couple of different dispatch companies. Um, it's the go safe uh, taxi charter. Um, and, and so again, there was this recognition that taxis were seen as a, a safe or reliable option for transportation, particularly during, during COVID. But we think that there's long-term implications that come out of this, right? If we can get passengers um, used to uh, the, the protocols or the processes of booking a cab because they believe it's a safe alternative, but then they form these habits, it's going to help the long-term booking volume. So um, we've, we've signed on with the, uh, the safe taxi, the, the go safe, go taxi charter. Um, and essentially what it's saying is that it's um, basically we're committing to these safety standards, right? <laughs> that the list here, and I won't, I won't read through them one by one, but um, these are the protocols that we, we agree to follow to or follow through with, we're committing um, to making sure that the, the ride is safe, that it's hygienic, um, that we're delivering an exceptional experience. And so we've had a couple of different companies, a variety of different fleets sign up to this. And, and what we've seen, again, is really positive PR traction. Um, and so, again, it's, it's reaffirmation from, uh, to the customer base, to your customer base, that we are committed to providing a safe experience, a great experience, and nothing's going to change, and we are still the reliable option here. So... That brings us into the next point, which is contactless payment. 
And really this was a huge piece for us pre-COVID um, because you're seeing obviously a, a, a trend towards this type of payment. There's been a huge adoption of Apple Pay, Google Pay. Um, those are features that we have built into the mobile app and we were working on this pre-COVID, but we really had to accelerate this because of, um, or, or going through COVID. So, um, you know, it's, it's gonna be important as we go forward to understand that this is a huge safety protocol, but it all, again, if you, can, if you can evolve with this and really start to adopt and push your customers to a contactless payment experience, it's going to, follow the long-term trends of how customers want to pay right uh, and we've seen that transition over the over the years right like going from cash only to now okay now we have to have credit card processing in the back um now we need to and now it needs to be this contactless payment it needs to be seamless with my passenger experience so what we've done with the passenger app um is is we've built in um, apple and google pay it's picked up and recognized automatically within the mobile app platform so um, if you're logged in and you get you have apple pay or google pay set up on your phone already we're going to pick that information up we're going to pull it into the mobile app um, we felt that this was the best way to de deploy it and primarily the, uh, the way to deploy it. Um, but there's also other ways that you can do this, right? You can, um, there's, there's some great tools that have been built. Uh, we, we've done some of this, but we also have a couple of customers who have built um, SMS payment portals where customers can do a similar thing. They can enter their, their, uh, their payment information via an SMS pay application and they can pay at the end of the ride and that's stored in the profile. Um, so there's, there's different ways to enhance this. And again, it's going to promote uh, or be in line with the promotion of that safety aspect. But what it also does is it creates a long-term stickiness um, with your customer base, right? Once you get them into this ecosystem where the payment processing is easy, their credit card profiles are stored, whether that's an app or again, we can do the same thing through SMS payments. Their, their information is in this ecosystem. It's easy to use. It's fluid. There's not a lot of friction in the, in the payment process. You're going to actually help your retention levels and drive long-term retention. So again, we can, we can leverage the safety aspect of this as, as sort of the priority and a reason to push and to market it. But over the long haul, it's going to uh, drive adoption of these different digital products and keep customers in your fleet. Um, likewise, I mentioned this point you know, it's really important to, um, to, to leverage this with account-based bookings. So we've, in our mobile app, we have migrated um, most of the voucher payments that are still happening within the system. Those can be migrated over to this, um, to the mobile app for contactless payment. And again, there's a variety of ways to do that, but this is how we have deployed it with an iCabby. Um, and that's really going to allow, you know, you to, you to leverage this with your account bookings, which again, when we talk about diversifying the revenue, sir, uh, um, revenue streams, we want to make sure that we've got those guys included in here. One thing that I will point out, it, if we start to talk about contactless payments, it's really important to ensure that you've built in proper fraud protection. So this is a little bit off tangent, but I do want to cover it because contactless payment is, is very open to fraudulent transactions. Um, so just to give you guys some context on how we do this, um, we do what's called a dynamic pre-authorization. Um, using a 3DS verification protocol. So that's an overly complicated way of saying that we authorize the customer's credit card for the fair amount at the beginning of the trip, right? So essentially what we're doing is when the customer places the booking, we are authorizing for the fair amount, right? We have the, the pickup and the destination, so we have an estimate of what the fare is. But we also use an algorithm and look at each fleet's historical bookings, and we authorize, um, let's, let's say that on average, um, the completed booking is 20% higher than the average, right? Because there's some extras added by the driver and there's a tip included at the end of it. So what we do is we say, okay, on a, that's the average. It's the estimated fair amount plus 20%. We authorize for that fair amount on the credit card. It is an optional thing that is flexible on a fleet to fleet level, but this is generally how it works. And what that's allowed us to do is reduce uh, fraud transactions our percent of fraud transactions to less than 1% on the mobile app so far. Um, so, so it's, it's a really efficient way, but it's something that you want to make sure that if you start to expand contactless payment options that you have this type of pre-authorization 3ds validation does uh, other things. It, it, it ensures that the customer billing information, everything from name to address to mobile phone number is validated and matches the, um, the actual billing information on the credit card. Um, and it allows you to block out fraudulent customers. So you want to ensure that you have those protocols and it's really important to start thinking about um, that protection because as you expand and if you migrate more customers onto this platform, fraud can become a serious concern. And we've seen that happen for, for products or processes that are not vetted historically. So, so the next piece we want to come to is 
data and insights, right? And we really want to um, perpetuate this idea that fleets should be measuring what they're doing, their productivity. Um, you know, in, in fairness, you guys don't need a report to tell you that business is down, right? That, that COVID has had a, a negative impact on business. So, you know, I, I can run you all the data tables in the world, but that's not going to be helpful. But what we do, where we do find this to be helpful is we want to start to measure the effectiveness of what we're doing. And that becomes that becomes more critical to business success when your resources are minimized, driver availability is lowered. Um, and I guess to give a couple of examples of that is, you know, if, if I've had to lay off call center staff or I have limited resources within my business, I really want to make sure that I'm automating my booking channels, right? I want my automation on my phone system to be high. I want my automation or the number of app and web bookings that I'm taking to be high, um, both because Again, I have limited resources within my business right now, um, and so it allows me to take more calls than I might be able to if I have to have manual interaction with all those bookings. But it's also going to allow you to scale up as you come out of, uh, again, coming out of COVID. So we've seen this, this growth from 33% to 64% uh, in, in North America on year-over-year -year bookings. And it's like, how can I adapt to make sure that I'm ready to take on those additional bookings? I don't want to be in a situation where I've got to rehire a bunch of people. So um, how, how do I set up these automation pieces to make sure that I can actually handle them? Um, likewise, we want to measure the effectiveness of those booking channels, right? So, um, you know, if, if I'm getting customers to come in, which again are incredibly valuable at this time from a variety of different sources, what's the likelihood that they complete the booking? What's the likelihood that they make the booking, but then they cancel, right? Every, every booking, every revenue stream at this point, uh, particularly when we're, when we're, you know, in a depressed market, but even coming out of it, it's, it's incredibly important to the life and the success of this business, right? And, and so we want to be able to measure those things. Things. What are we doing effectively? Okay, cool. Let's do more of that. What are we not doing effectively? Let's do less of that, right? Very straightforward, but it's hard to tell if you can't measure that information. So within iCabby, we have a tool called Business Insights. Um, and really, we use this to measure 38 core KPIs within the system. Um, this is continuing to grow, continuing to enhance. We're going to add some custom reporting tools on the top of this. Um, but these are, this is just, again, a, a kind of an overall list of all the, the uh, key pieces that we want to measure and we want to get visibility on from, um, from a customer uh, level standpoint, right? And it's the basic stuff. We have that information in there, you know, number of bookings, what's my booking completion, how many active drivers I have. But we want to start to be able to look at information like, as an example, um, what's my average bookings per hour, right? When are my peak times? When are my low times? Do I need to reallocate my driver schedule off the back of that? You know, or are my bookings, uh, my average bookings per hour, a function of how many drivers I have on the road, right? If I put more drivers out at 4 p.m., does that increase the number of bookings I get at 4 p.m.? And so you can't make those decisions without getting the data and then you can't see the progress or the success of that information um, if you don't have the data to measure that, right? Um, and so we have a, a variety of tools in here. Most customers in this and our customer base have access to this, um, but it's definitely, we want, we want to start to build the framework out of this. So um, off the back of this, we have a bit of a homework assignment for you guys. So um, off the back of this, this, this webinar, what I'd like you guys to do is to go and see if you can identify these pieces within your fleet. Um, you know, if you're, if you're already doing Insights Premium and you have this information, that's great. You can ignore me while I'm talking right now, but um, we want you to look at a couple of KPIs, right? So what we pull out of, out of Insights is core, core components or core measures. Uh, it starts with booking automation and completion. And, and for all the reasons that I just talked about, right? Not only do we want to make sure that as more bookings or additional bookings come into the platform from whatever source they're coming in from, we want to make sure that we're automating those. We're not requiring a manual touch point on this, but we also want to make sure that we're delivering service and we're completing these bookings, right? That's, that's fairly obvious and self-explanatory. But again, when you look at it, just to share an interesting um, conversation I had with a customer, um, I had a customer that, uh, that I was speaking to that firmly believed that July and August were his slow periods and um, September was his busy period. And that was because that had always been the case. You know, traditionally he saw booking increases at that time. But what happened is when we actually went and looked at the data, there had been a flip in the past, I want to say two and a half, three years, where the July and August uh, time periods had actually grown and his September um, booking totals had decreased. You know, now they hadn't surpassed each other. So he still 
at the core of it, he was correct, right? It was a busier time, but he had seen exponential growth in those slow times. And because he wasn't measuring or tracking those, he didn't have visibility on that, didn't know, couldn't respond to it, et cetera. So important pieces to look at. Um, we really want you guys to look at on-time performance. I think that a, a huge piece of it, you know, particularly with fleets that are, are down in size, we want to be able to measure, you know, are we getting to passengers on time? Do we need to reconfigure our zones? Um, how are we looking at the business? Uh, and along with that are accept reject rates that are, that are happening with our driver base, right? So I think it's really important not only to make sure that you have drivers within your business that are either here that are servicing bookings, but I want drivers that are willing to work with my team and with dispatch, right? So I don't want a bunch of guys that are going to sign into my, into uh, my platform and then they're going to reject 80% of the bookings, which we've seen happen, right? So I want to be able to identify those drivers and move them off the platform so I can make space for drivers that are going to help my business and help the customers, right? We'll go into demand zones. So we have an application within iCabby Insights where we can look at where our, uh, which zones or which areas our bookings are coming from. And what that's allowing us to do is again, not only just reallocate drivers or remap the zones to be more effective, but it's also allowing um, fleets to identify new markets. So we had a, uh, a customer in California and looking at this information and basically said, hey, we're, we're going to expand over into a, uh, another township or another county because we're seeing a large booking volume come out of this area and we're not really servicing it. And so it's, again, an opportunity to grow business and diversify the areas within which we're working. And last, we want, we want to see if you guys can measure your customer churn, right? Go and see, hey, what's my turnover? What's the lifetime value of a customer? Um, we want to start to look at retention because we know traditionally in the taxi industry, whether it's for traditional dispatch or app bookings, there's a ton of turnover. There's a ton of customer churn. Do we have an idea on that? Do we know what the value is if we lose a customer versus if we retain a customer? And particularly during these downtimes, who are the customers that are continuing to book with me so that I can focus on them and I can target my efforts, whether it be marketing or operations or service to those specific customers because they are driving the revenue within my business. So a couple of pieces to see if you can go and pull out and see if you've got those available to look at. Um, really quickly, I'm going to talk, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going on 45 minutes now, so I'm going to talk about some operational efficiencies and partnerships. Um, we see operational efficiencies really enhanced around three core elements, right? And that's products, that's partners, and API. We're going to talk about partners as a secondary, um, as, a, as a supplemental strategy here. But we really want to start with product and API. Um, so, so from a product standpoint, it's not just about, you know, you know, I think that there's this, this, uh, demand within the market where everybody's like, Hey, I got to have an app, right? I need to have an app because I need to be competitive with, with Uber, with TNCs, and it's just the thing to do. But I think really what we have to look at is what's the user engagement like, and how do we fo focus on core applications, right? So, um, again, going back to the contactless payment, Contactless payment is important because it is a function of COVID, but it's also the way that the market is trending. So are we building and developing and utilizing products that match our customer behavior, right? Um, likewise, there's markets where it doesn't make sense to have a mobile app, right? Because that's not what, how the customers use the platform and maybe they're all web bookers and maybe we can convert some of those customers, but you know, it's not always the end all be all for these solutions. But you know, we've really have tried from, from our product standpoint to say, what, what are the identifying, what are the emerging trends, um, and, and how do we adapt to them? So again, another great example of this is at the beginning of COVID, and again, not to, not to toot our own horn, but just how we've evolved the product, we, we had a ton of requests from fleets to really enhance the delivery side of the mobile application. And so we went in, and it was something that we had in the backlog that we wanted to do eventually, but because of customer feedback and they said, hey, we need this because it's how our market is evolving. We went ahead and accelerated and plugged that into our mobile app and added the delivery functionality within the mobile app. So um, as we go through that and as we look at how the product's evolving, it's important to plug those in. Likewise, you know, again, we've, we, we reference this with our voice products, the voice standard, the voice plus, the driver call, call out options, which again, a lot of you on the call are familiar with. How are we enhancing the process so we're in a position to, again, protect resources within the business? You know, I don't, I don't mean to say like, hey, fleets have had to lay off people within the business. That's definitely a reality of our situation. But, you know, sitting on a call center answering phone calls is not always the most effective way to deploy people either, right? So we have, we have a group of talented people that could be, you know, um, doing outbound sales that could be calling on businesses that could be advocating for your business, doing marketing, you know, managing driver operations. Um, so how do we, how do we put 
uh, fleets in a position to reallocate those resources. And again, it's really foundational on the product, right? Can we automate this, these processes within our business that, you know, create a great customer experience, but also allow us to bypass the need for people on this? Because again, in, in my perspective with this sort of generation of knowledge work, human capital is the most valuable capital. So you want to be able to redirect that to applications within your business that are valuable and useful. Uh, and likewise, you want to be able to scale as your business grows, right? And so again, if it's super, it's super human dependent on this side of these of the business with simple applications or simple tasks, then you have to grow that, you know, sort of limited um, cost prohibitive side of the business where you can put in automation processes that are going to allow you to grow um, and scale quickly as your business either returns on the back of COVID or grows just as a function of all the things that you're doing. So, you know, you want to start to look to automate these pieces of the business, filtering, you know, calls, you know, SMSs to replace unanswered calls doing customer engagement through a phone system or through SMS booking, uh, and even things like no-show approval. How do we automate those through either the platform, our phone system, our mobile app? How do we off offload those from you know, our call center onto these various avenues? So the other piece of this is the API. And we published a, um, a, a getting started guide a couple of weeks ago that basically give some uh, the customer our customer base some projects to work on to get them familiar with working with the APIs. And so really what the the, the API does for us um, is it allows customers to enhance their booking automation while driving down their cost. And essentially what we're doing is we're automating and optimizing the way that we're getting bookings into the system. Um, and while again, driving down that cost per booking because it doesn't require manual intervention. It doesn't require us to interface to a different portal. Um, it really allows us to automate the ways that we're taking bookings into the system. So we can share those guides on the back of this with everyone. I won't go into to super detail, but um, again, it's, it's really something that, you know, if you're not leveraging your APIs today, you need to be doing so. Uh, it doesn't, again, require you to be a developer. You just have to have some familiarity with how they work. And we can, we can support you uh, and help you with those. Um, because it's also going to allow you to leverage partnerships, which brings us to this last and, and final strategic point. Um, we really want you guys to start thinking about various partnerships that you can plug into your business, right? Um, and so really from an impact standpoint, we want you guys to think about uh, partners in the framework of you know, the taxi 360 ecosystem, right? This is kind of our driving mission. It's kind of our approach to our customer base and how we engage with taxi fleets. But the partners that you're, you're working with, they're not just siloed to, you know, hey, they can help me do fleet optimization and get bookings into the system. Um, they're, they're, there's partnerships that will impact um, the driver side of, any, of, of this. So, you know, how are we enhancing the driver experience? Can we automate driver payments? How are we getting them their money faster? Um, on the passenger side as well, we talked about, you know, Caboodle it. Um, how are they enhancing the, the passenger booking experience from a delivery standpoint? And then again, obviously on the core side with the fleet, how are we getting, you know, how are we better managing our dispatch? How are we automating these processes? So we want to think about it as within all these touch points and what partners can we bring in and we, can we leverage to improve that? So we mapped this out recently and this is, I think, just a great example of all the touch points where partners can sort of augment and support a customer journey, right? And so we're, what we're looking at is the mapping of a year as their book their journey follows through all the way to the end from the billing standpoint. And these um, companies that are listed here are all marketplace partners that are engaging at some point of the process to really enhance or optimize that portion of the booking experience. So, um, you know, we have the traditional stuff on the front end by uh, call centers like Aspired and PacBiz, which are great call centers and they help to uh, offshore and automate some of those call uh, call center costs to booking aggregators like Taxi Butler or Carhu, where we're pulling together alternative booking sources and giving customers different channels in which to book and to plug into the system uh, all the way to the end. So we have a great, uh, great partner in Gower Modules, which does passenger experience. They're really focused on driving customer retention in the instance that a customer has a, you know, a less than positive booking experience or negative booking experience, how do we bring them back into the ecosystem and retain them all the way to the payment end again with, with different pieces like AirPay and that sort of stuff. So really quickly, we've got a little bonus strategy for you and then I'll open it up to questions. This is not on the list, but we thought this would be kind of fun and interesting to throw this in. So as many of you are aware on this call, um, we formed a COVID-19 task force internally um, back in March, really when the pandemic hit and we started to go into lockdown. And essentially what this was, was a cross-functional team, pulled people from finance, marketing, sales, 
um, all across the board. We had executive support on this. And it was this, this group or this committee that was really focused on building customer initiatives and then deploying them across our customer base um, while our, our customers were in distress. And we found that it was a really effective way to work and it really allowed us to drive, you know, um, push strategic objectives across the business or, or really focus on these initiatives and drive them from, you know, ideation to execution. Um, and so it's something that we actually, uh, we are going to keep going forward. So we formed this team internally and that's actually decided to say, hey, look, I know we're kind of, we're not post COVID, but things are, are starting to, to um, recover, to, to recoup. And so we're actually going to keep this cross-functional team within the business to drive other strategic initiatives that are really focused around helping and supporting customers. What's best for our customers and how do we get those into actionable items and deploy that and so our recommendation to you guys is hey um, you guys can form your own committees within your fleets and it's a really creative and interesting way to put a centralized focus on the customers from all corners of the business and then deploy impactful meaningful initiatives that are going to support them and, and again that translates into increased bookings and increased revenue for you guys so all of that said I wanted to ask everyone, as we always do, to, uh, to we're going to do a quick poll, see how useful you guys found this. Um, you know, we appreciate the feedback. Um, if you guys can vote on this, I'll, I'll leave it open for uh, about a minute or two to actually get some feedback. But yeah, we want to do these. Um, they're designed to be helpful, supportive to you guys. Um, you know, I know we, we quickly went through some of these, these applications, so we're happy to, to give more and, and, and elaborate on any of this information off the top of it. Um, but hopefully you guys found this, this information relevant. So any feedback is definitely welcomed. While we're doing that, we're waiting for uh, the completions of, uh, of the seminar. If anybody has questions, feel free. There's a Q&A channel or a, a chat channel. So feel free to drop your questions into either of those and we'll, we'll take a couple and answer them as we, uh, as we complete this. So cool. Looks like Joanna's closed that out. Um, awesome. Thank you for the feedback guys. Again, we appreciate you sharing this with us. It's always again, helpful to get that feedback. Um, and we will go ahead and open it to any questions. I'm going to, apologies, I'm going to minimize the screen a little bit so I can see that the, any of the QAs that's come through. Um, so just a, a few quick ones. Um, so one that we get asked a lot and, and has come up again is, do we have to do, I need to be a developer to start using API integrations. So no, you don't need to be a developer to start using uh, API integrations. If you have a developer on staff, it's definitely helpful. I, I won't, I won't lie. There's definitely some really cool and unique things that they can do, but at this point they've probably already recognized it and are doing it. Um, but we've had, you know, a lot of customers that again are not classically trained developers. They're not software engineers. They're just really interested, curious customers. And they figured out how the APIs speak and work with other partners and they'd be able to create some really cool dynamic solutions, whether that's, you know, plugging in um, some different phone functionality with the APIs uh, via SMS for Twilio or using products like Integromat to automate, you know, some of the booking process. There's, there's a whole plethora of, piece of, of things that can be done and we'll definitely support you. So like I said, I, uh, we created a, a get started guide for our APIs. We can absolutely give you access to our API um, our, our, our API documentation. It's open. We share it with everybody. So if you haven't received that before and you want to look at it and want to start to mess around with it, we can definitely do that. So um, another one really quickly, uh, how are fleets promoting new business lines um, like delivery or prescription? Um, so it's been interesting. We've seen fleets kind of promote some of these, these enhancements or these added, um, these markets that they're starting to enter. We've done it in a variety of different ways. So we're getting, obviously there's a lot of leverage off of social media. They're sharing it, you know, Facebook, Instagram, wherever, talking about it with their customers. Um, we've also had customers do outbound calling, which has been really interesting. So they've taken staff that are, you know, maybe not busy because they're, they're not getting the same amount of calls coming in. And they've actually done outbound calling to their customer base to say, hey, look, I know you may not be riding anywhere right now, but we have these new services and we can go and pick up your groceries or any of your medication. Or actually, if you need us to even move you to a, uh, take you to a medical appointment, we are open to do all of that. And so uh, it's varied across the board, but again, it, there's, there's no lack of ways. And again, if there's anything we can do from a, a marketing standpoint to support that we're, we're happy to help. So 
I think that that's all of the questions that have come through. So um, I appreciate everybody's time today. Again, I know how valuable it is, especially in these current conditions. So hopefully everybody found this useful and uh, I will look forward to catching up with each of you soon. Thanks guys. Take care.